Hey, welcome back. We've been talking about motion and physics classes, and we're getting to the end of this motion unit in terms of kinematics, the study of motion, but there is one thing we haven't talked about yet, and that's relative velocity. Relative velocity is really quite interesting, actually, and it can really be something that can blow your mind if you've never thought about this. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. Some of this starts out with an easy example. The easiest example I can think of Let's imagine kids are running on a train. They shouldn't be running, but they've been on this train for a long time. They just run up and down on a train when they just need to get some energy out. Let's say the train is traveling in a positive direction at 30 meters per second to the right, and the kids are going to be traveling at 1 meter per second to the right with respect to the train. My question is, how fast are the kids going relative to the Earth? Well, that hopefully is going to be pretty easy. That's going to be 31 meters a second with respect to the Earth. Okay, now let's make the problem a little bit more difficult, slightly. Let's imagine the kids now have run all the way down to one end of the train, and then they need to run back. And they're running at the exact same speed, but in the opposite direction. Remember, speed is a scalar quantity. What is the velocity of the kids with respect to the Earth? Well, hopefully you're able to come up with the velocity of the kids with respect to the Earth is going to be 29 meters per second to the right. So from the train's point of view, they're only traveling 1 meter per second to the left. But if we're looking at a frame of reference of the Earth, like the kids with respect to the Earth, they are moving at 29 meters per second to the right. And that's what we mean by a frame of reference. A frame of reference, it's our fixed set of coordinates that we can use to base our measurements from, our assumed origin, you could say. And there are a couple things to say at the outset. One, every frame of reference is legitimate. The laws of physics are followed for every frame of reference. Secondly, what we call our frame of reference is very important. All right, so let's see how this all plays out. First of all, I do want to ask you a question. Are you moving right now? Let's say you're sitting at a desk, looking at a computer, maybe you're looking at your phone, although this is probably hard to read the text if you're looking at a phone and watching the screencast. Let's assume you're just stationary, you're just sitting at a desk or something like that. Are you moving? And the answer is, well, it depends, actually. It depends on your frame of reference. If your frame of reference is you or the Earth, usually we assume our frame of reference is like us or where we are at on the surface of the Earth. Then you would say, yeah, we're not moving at all. But if you consider the frame of reference like the center of our galaxy or the center of the universe, we're moving. We're moving a lot. What do I mean? I mean the Earth is rotating, right? The Earth spins. How long does it take to spin? 24 hours, roughly. How long does it take to go all the way around in its orbit, 365 days plus 0.25 more or less. And then you've got the rotation of the Milky Way galaxy, the expansion of the universe. So it actually depends. The answer to a simple question like, are you moving right now? If we're assuming that we are a frame of reference or the Earth is our frame of reference, which we usually do, then we would say, nope, not really moving right now. But if we say the frame of reference is somewhere else, then you would have to say, yeah, there is motion. All right, so let's talk more specifically about how to set up equations with relative velocity. First of all, there's no standard equation for relative velocity, but there are two main strategies I'd like you to use to create relative velocity equations and solve them. The first thing I want to say is the order of these subscripts matter. You could say like the velocity of the kids with respect to the train is a positive one meter per second. I'm going to assume to the right is positive, to the left is negative, and the velocity of the train with respect to the earth is going to be a positive 30 meters per second. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is start with the velocity of the overall object, like the kids, compared to the frame of reference, like the earth. We want the velocity of the kids with respect to the earth in this problem. So you already knew how to do this in your mind, but we're actually breaking down how we did that. And we can use this example to solve other problems that are not as easy. All right, and then your next step is going to be to write that is equal to the velocity of the object, like the kids, in reference to an intermediary device, like the train. An intermediary device, I mean, something that's like in the middle that connects two other ideas. So in this case, the train connects the kids to the Earth, you could say. So the train is going to be our intermediary device right here. And then we add the velocity of the intermediary device, like the train, in reference to our overall frame of reference. So the velocity of the train with respect to the Earth. And then this is a mathematically true statement that we can write right here. In other words, the velocity of the kids with respect to the Earth is equal to the velocity of the kids with respect to the train 
and the velocity of the train with respect to the earth. All right, and there's one more strategy. Oftentimes problems are given to you where it's not this easy, where they give you the opposite velocity of what you need, and, and you have to make that negative. You have to make whatever it is negative. So let me throw you a curveball, and this is actually really useful to think about. What would the problem have given us if they give us the movement of the Earth with respect to the train? I want you to think about what that means for a moment. The movement of the Earth with respect to the train. So the train is the frame of reference. What would the Earth appear to be doing if you were like, the conductor of the train in the very front of the train, how would the Earth appear to be moving from your point of view? Well, it would appear to be moving from front to back. And so if they gave us the velocity of the Earth with respect to the train, well, it would be to the left in this diagram right here. So it would be a negative 30 meters per second. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does, because it's getting a little tougher now to understand this, this concept's a little bit tougher. But if they had given us the velocity of the Earth with respect to the train, they would have given us negative 30 meters a second. Well, what would the opposite be then? If we're talking about a vector, what's the opposite of a vector? Well, it's going to be the opposite sign of the vector if it's all in one axis. So you could say, well, the opposite of a negative 30 is going to be positive 30. And that's the second strategy you need to know. So you have to be able to set up this in an equation format. And you need to know that if they give you something that is the opposite of what you need, like in these terms, the way they're written right here with the subscripts, if they give you something that is the opposite to what you need, then you will need to change the sign of whatever it is you're working with then. Okay, and the last thing I want to say while we're talking about our general strategy is I do want to say this does remind me of the transitive property of algebra a little bit. So just to remind you, that the transitive property of algebra says if x equals y and y equals z, then x equals z. Notice y is like our intermediary thing. That just kind of goes away, right? And we want x in the frame of reference of z, you could say. Well, in a similar way up here, we could say if we want the kids with respect to the earth, the train is essentially the intermediary thing that goes away. So at least for me, that analogy works. It's not exactly the same, but it helps me to understand that you have an intermediary that essentially is going to leave the problem if you set it up correctly, if you set up the mathematical equation correctly. What I would like to do next is show you how this works in a two-dimensional system using the exact same strategy. So I'm going to do that in the next screencast. If you have any comments, please leave them below. And I hope you have a great day.